we're going to pause our study of the horse's seals for a moment to address a topic that we will see later applies to the black horse and the pale horse. Let's start the study by reading Matthew 6, verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This verse makes it very clear that God is a personal God, because we are supposed to address him as Father. Therefore, if he's our Father, we must be his children. Also notice that God is in a place or location called heaven and rules from the sanctuary in heaven. In this study, we are going to discuss many things you may have thought about or heard before, but I want you to notice the way all of the points are interconnected, because at the end of the study, we are going to talk about a philosophy which has almost overtaken the whole world, including the Christian world. Let's read Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This verse makes it very clear that God pre-existed the universe. In other words, God existed before his creation. But more importantly, has always existed. In other words, God is not a created being, and he's separate from his creation. Now, let's look at Colossians 1 verses 16 to 7. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things consist. Principalities can be interpreted as rulers. Powers can be interpreted Authorities. After reading this, it should uh, become clear that Jesus Christ is the Creator, existed before His creation, pre existed from the Trinity. And that there is a distinction and or separation between Him and His creation, or from the universe. In fact, He transcends or he transcends his creation. To further illustrate this, let's turn to John 1, verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Notice that it doesn't say, in the beginning became the Word. It says that in the beginning the Word already was. He pre-existed before what? Before his creation. Verse 2. Do these verses make it clear that Jesus pre-existed his creation and was distinct from or separate from and transcends his creation? As our Creator, the Bible calls him our Father. But once he becomes incarnate one of us he becomes our brother from this we should be able to conclude that there was a time before creation where there were no universe or galaxies and christ and god the father existed then if you fall into the trap of thinking the universe has always existed then you must conclude that the universe is equal to God, that that is a lie. Notice Genesis 1.11. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. Genesis 1.11. Who created the plants and the vegetation? Jesus. Are the plants and the vegetations eternal, like Jesus? Is or did it have an origin? According to Genesis 1.11, it had an origin. Now, let's go to Genesis 1.21. So God created great sea creatures, 
and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Did the fish and the birds have an origin or beginning? Yes. Who made them? Jesus. Now turn with me to verse 24. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and, and beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so, Genesis 1.24. Were the living creatures created by Jesus? Did they have an origin during creation week? Absolutely. Now, let's go to Genesis 2.7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Genesis 2.7. Is man eternal, or did man have a beginning? According to this verse, man did not always exist. He was created. Now turn with me to Isaiah 64, verse 8, where we find additional information about the creation of man. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay, and thou art our potter. And we all are the work of thy hand, Isaiah 64, verse 8. This is very similar to Genesis 2, 7. But in this verse, it adds the fact that our Creator, Jesus, is our Father. So the book of Genesis makes it very clear that everything in this earth had an origin. It had a beginning. It also makes it clear that God who created these things pre-existed these things and transcends, is separate and distinct from His creation. Now let's notice where life originated or the source of life, of the life of creation. Turn with me to Acts 17, verses 24 to 28. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth all life and breath in all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the earth, all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bonds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Acts 17 verses 24 to 28. Who is the source of our life and existence? According to this verse, God or Jesus. Now notice what we find in Genesis 2 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2 9. Did man have to eat? from the tree of life to have his existence perpetuated? Yes. How do we know that? After Adam and Eve sinned, they were cast out of the garden because God did not want them to eat from the tree of life and continue living forever. If they had already had eternal life, abiding within themselves, then it would have made no difference if they continued eating from the tree or not. On this point, notice Genesis 3, 22-24. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live 
forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way to the tree of life. Genesis 3, 22-24 According to Genesis, did man depend on a source of life outside of himself? Yes, the tree of life was a source of life, and Adam himself was not the source. And so God used this to teach Adam that the source of life was outside of himself. In other words, the life of man was received and derived from God through the tree of life and was not inherent in man or belong to man by nature. As we discussed before, man was given dominion over the earth. And we find that in Genesis 1, 26-28. If man was given dominion over the earth, does that make him superior to creation? Was he king of creation? Yes. If man was placed to rule over nature, then nature and man are not equal. Animals and man are not the same. Plants and man are not the same. Man was created distinct and separate from nature because he was given dominion over creation and was himself created in the image of God. Now notice Genesis 2.15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep or cultivate it. Genesis 2.15. What did God place Adam in the garden for? To be the caretaker. Adam was to care for creation, not misuse or mistreat creation. He was the one who was to maintain the garden in beauty and order. He was to take care of the ecosystem as creation's superior. Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. What know ye not, that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with the price. Therefore glorify God in your body, and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20 Why was Adam supposed to take care of the garden? Because it was God's. According to Paul, why are we supposed to take care of our bodies because they belong to God? New Agers believe we are supposed to take care of our bodies not because they are God's, but because they are God. Let's notice a few other things about creation. Turn with me to Genesis 2, 16-17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Genesis 2, 16-17 From this text we can see God established a law outside of man, or external to man, that God expected man to obey. Was Adam and Eve accountable to God as a superior? Absolutely. Notice, after they sinned, something interesting occurred. Turn to Genesis 3, 8 to 11. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam, and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. 
And he said, Who told thee thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? Genesis 3, 8 to 11. Notice that in these verses, God is requiring Adam to give an account for what he's done. This establishes that God is separate from Adam and greater than Adam, that he has a law, his words or commands, which he expects his creatures to obey. Notice also Genesis 3.13, when God speaks to Eve, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Genesis 3.13 3, uh, 3, Is God asking them both to give an account of what they have done? Absolutely. Will we also have to give an account of our actions before our Creator? Turn to 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10 Who does it say? we all, according, including Adam, will have to give an account to Christ. Notice also John 5, 22 and 27. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, and hath given him authority to exercise judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. John 5, 22 and 27. Who will be our judge? Who will we have to give an account to as our superior? Jesus Christ, the Son of God and man. Now let's look at Ecclesiastes 11.9, where Solomon is speaking to the youth. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Live it up. Walk in the ways of your heart. Have a good time. And in the sight of your eyes. But know that for all these, God will bring you into judgment. Ecclesiastes 11.9 Then Ecclesiastes 12.1 says to the youth that because they remember that God is going to bring them into judgment, he says, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Do you realize we are now in that judgment time? Let's look at Revelation 14, verses 6 to 7. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Revelation 14, verses 6 to 7. Do you see how the idea of judgment, having come, is connected to the fact that Jesus is the creator? Is this make it clear that we all must render an account of our actions. As a result of sin, did man begin to die? Man had to eat from the tree of life to continue living. But when Adam and Eve sinned, did they and their descendants begin to die just like God said they would? Yes. So man must not be immortal then. Genesis 2.17 states clearly that when they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would surely die. In other words, God is saying he's going to judge them, and if they are found guilty, then they will surely die. 
In Genesis 3.19, God sentenced Adam to death. Is there anyone in this world without sin? No, not according to Romans 3.23. As a result of sin, the sentence of death is pronounced against man. Romans 5.12. Thankfully, Christ came to this world to pay the death penalty so that we would have the option to be saved. Review Genesis 3, 1 to 5, and notice that Satan is telling Eve that if she eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that she will be like God. Notice the word in the King James Version is God's, but it's the plural version of the same word as used in Genesis 1, 1, Elohim. What we find in these verses is the devil is sharing two lies. First lie is you're not going to die. The second lie is you don't have to obey God's law because you can be a law unto yourself. Why do we worship God? Because according to to the Bible, God is the creator or maker. Note Psalms 95 verses 1 to 6. Has God also given us a sign that he is the creator? If so, what is the sign? Notice Exodus 20 verses 8 to 11. This is the fourth commandment where God gives a command in the first few verses, then gives a reason for obeying it in the last verse, verse 11. The observance of the Sabbath is a recognition on our parts that God is the great creator. He's superior to us, and we are his creatures, the works of his hands. See also Exodus 31, verse 13, and Ezekiel 20, 20. There are two ideas mentioned in Isaiah that I want us to notice. So let's turn to Isaiah 66, verses 22 to 23. For as the heavens and the earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Isaiah 66, verses 22 to 23. What will be the motivation for worship in the new earth? The fact that Jesus made the heavens and the new earth, new heavens and new earth. At the beginning, the Sabbath was observed to commemorate the creation that was made at the beginning. Now, we observe the Sabbath for two reasons, because Jesus rested in the tomb on the Sabbath, and his followers rested too. Someday, when Jesus makes a new heaven and a new earth, his people are going to observe the Sabbath in eternity, according to this passage. So the Sabbath points to Christ as our Creator, Redeemer, and Restorer. Let's talk about this New Age philosophy that's overtaken the world. For New Age philosophers, God is an impersonal, immaterial, uh, cosmic force of energy that permeates the entire universe. In New Age theology, God is not a person who lives in a place called heaven. He is not a loving father who cares for his creatures. This is a New Age philosophy called pantheism. The idea that God is everything and everything is God. Their idea is that the universe is God and God is indistinguishable from the universe because God is the universe and the universe is God. In other words, God is within nature, and because man is a part of nature, and nature is God, man is ultimately what? Man is God. There's no distinction 
between the creator and the creature. In the New Age philosophy, God is not separate, distinct, independent, and transcendent from his creation. Instead, God is creation. According to New Age philosophy, the universe has been eternally created itself by the process of evolution. With this system, there is no place for a personal loving God who is distinct from his creation, who transcends his creation, because God is creation rather than the creator. This must mean that if the universe is God, who is immortal, and man is a part of the universe. Man is God, and man must be also immortal. New Agers are great ecologists, because to them, nature is God. We as Christians should be the best ecologists, because to us, nature it belongs to God. Where did this New Age philosophy come from? It came from the serpent in the garden. Let me share with you a quote from the New Ager book. This consciousness shows the cosmic to consist not of dead matter governed by unconscious, rigid, and unintending law. It shows it on the contrary as entirely immaterial, entirely spiritual, and entirely alive. It shows that death is an absurdity, that everyone and everything has eternal life. It shows that the universe is God and that God is a universe, and that no evil does or ever did enter into it. This is from R.M. Bucky's Cosmic Consciousness, page 14. Tell me something. If I'm God, whose law am I supposed to keep? My own. What's to say your law is greater than mine if we are both gods? So New Agers talk about how each of us has values within ourselves, and all we have to do is discover the values that we need to live by. Therefore, it doesn't matter if someone wants to live a homosexual or heterosexual lifestyle. If we are both God, what's to say one person's lifestyle is better than another's? In other words, man becomes autonomous. Do you know what the word autonomous means? It comes from two Greek words, atos and nomos, meaning self-law, which means your law, you're a law unto yourself. Because if you're God, then to whose law are you accountable if you're accountable to God's law? You're accountable only to yourself. Allow me to read to you a quote from a book called A Crash Course on the New Age. For them, New Agers, one's self is ultimately indistinguishable from God. There is therefore no final power external to the self whose laws must be obeyed. Each person creates his or her own reality, good or bad, by the way he handles the law of his own being. If he can learn to harness the resources of his higher self, his possibilities are limitless. A Crash Course on the New Age, uh, Miller, page 119. If God is everywhere in all things, and you are God, then there's no such thing as sin. If there's no sin, then there's no law. And if no law, then there's no death. 
because if you are God and God is immortal, then you are immortal. Then the question is, who do you have to give an account to? If you're God, then no one but yourself. For the New Ager, salvation means to harness the Godhood within, then society will regenerate itself. The world will become perfect, and you'll enter the age of Aquarius. Are you seeing the difference between these two worldviews? Do you see how some want to mix the two together? Consider how some Christians think they are immortal. They say, we don't have to keep the law because Jesus kept the law in, in my place. Now, that's very dangerous theology. They might call themselves Christians, but the end result of that school of thought is basically the same. New Age philosophy, or spiritualism, asserts that men are unfallen demigods, that each mind will judge itself, that true knowledge places men above all law, that all sins committed are innocent, for whatever is, is right, and God doth not condemn. The basest of human beings is represented as in heaven, and highly exalted there. Thus it declares, to all men, it matters not what you do. Live as you please. Heaven is your home. Multitudes are thus led to believe that desire is the highest law, that license is liberty, and that man is accountable only to himself. This is the same as Lucifer said in heaven. I will be like the Most High, and to Adam and Eve, you will be like gods. You will not truly die. This theory totally obliterates the Sabbath. God has given us the Sabbath as a sign to protect us from these theories because it's the one sign, the only law, that makes a clear distinction between the Creator and His creatures. Every time we keep a Sabbath, we are announcing to the world that we are created by the great creator God and, his, and are his followers. Does this spiritualistic teaching sound like any particular so-called Christian religion you know of? How about Mormons? One of the primary leaders of the Mormon movement after Joseph Smith was Brigham Young, who states, The devil told the truth about the Godhead. I do not blame Mother Eve. I would not have her miss eating the forbidden fruit for anything. Through the gift of sin, humanity can achieve Godhood. Ye were also in the beginning with the Father. Man was also in the beginning with God. Intelligence or the light of truth was not created or made, neither indeed can be. Doctrine of Covenants, a Mormon book. For the purpose of, again, comparing truth with error, with error let's look at 1 Timothy 2.14. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. 1 Timothy 2.14. What does it mean to be deceived? According to biblical dictionaries, to mislead, to cause to believe what is false, or disbelieve what is true. Does that sound like a good thing or bad? Who will you believe? 